In his nearly 50-year career, Geraldo Rivera has had, in his own words, more ups and downs than the cyclone roller coaster at Coney Island. At 28, the radical lawyer turned journalist wrote and reported an expose of a notorious institution that changed the world forever for families touched by developmental disabilities. Some years later, he opened Al Capone's empty vault to a live audience of millions, got his nose broken on television's most notorious studio brawl, did 11 tours covering the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, was a celebrity apprentice, and danced with the stars. And the man who has been called a crusader, a fool, a role model, a sellout, a trailblazer, and an opportunist, among other things, has now chronicled his unique and remarkable life in his latest book, The Geraldo Show, a memoir. Geraldo Rivera joins us now. Geraldo, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Raph. As I told you, all those words I got from your book, yeah, so right. don't blame me. You didn't mention I'm going to do a Naked and Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, Harold, last... fact, I'll start right now. <laughs> no, please, <laughs> please. Last time you were on the program, we spoke about your legendary expose of Willowbrook, which, as I said in the introduction, changed the world forever for individuals and families touched by developmental disabilities. Um, in your book, you describe that expose as your professional peak and that the rest of your life has been a postscript. Tell us why. You know, it was so big, Ralph. It changed not only... Uh, you know, the people who were the targets of the, the, the probe, it, it exposed the conditions, the horrible warehousing of, of developmentally disabled children and adults, and it just uh, it really revealed how society had turned its back on this population, how they were being closeted, how they were being, uh, you know, warehoused. But I also rode the coattails of that that storm to celebrity in the yeah. jet set, and it kind of made me a household name. Yeah. And for a while, for years after, I mean, I'm still deeply involved. We're having our second golf tournament of the year. Brian Kilmeade, my colleague at Fox News, just gave 10 grand. We've raved for the for, for the Wilbur. For the Wilbur, we've raved tens of millions of dollars. And we've had 50 yeah. homes in the New York area. Yeah, you keep area. changing people's keep lives. Change. But, you know, in terms of the emotional explosion that happened when, when I did that expose and, and, the, and, the, and the quantum movement in my life, I've never matched. I've never matched that. I mean, as I've gotten, maybe I'm more of a household name now, more controversial in some ways now. <laughs> One of the I'm few people, older who people know by their first name only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right, me and Lassie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you said, you touched on this, you said that uh, you had a choice to make and you decided to become what you call the first rock and roll newsman. That's what, in the 70s, that's what I was. Yeah. If, you had, if you could go back again, if you had the opportunity, would you change that? Would your choices be different? You know, I've been married five times, so when you asked me that question, if what would I change? <laughs> I said, I'm not going to mess with it. <laughs> the house of cards is still standing. I'm going to leave it that way. I'm not going to tempt fate. <laughs> I'll so what play this hand. So what end. exactly led to Al Capone's vault? You know, I was unemployed at the time. I had been fired from ABC in 1985. I was fired after 15 great years, including the Willowbrook exposés. I was the highest rated uh, person. I was a senior producer. I got fired because of a beef I had with Rune Arledge, yeah. my legendary boss. Uh, Celia Chase, my colleague at 2020, where I was a senior producer as well as senior correspondent, reported the story on the Kennedy family and uh, uh, their alleged, the boys, uh, or the boys, the president and the attorney general's alleged sexual relationship with Marilyn Monroe. This was Sylvia Chase's story. Rune had spiked it. I allege that he spiked it, killed the story because of his relationship with the Kennedy family. He fired me, so I was the most famous unemployed person in America. Someone said to me, uh, you know, we'll give you 25 grand if you open up this gangster's vault on uh, live TV in Chicago. 25 grand, I said, well, my monthly nut is 50. If you give me 50, I'll do it. And that's why I did Al Capone's vault. <laughs> well, you know, it was empty and, uh, and nobody else could could do what you it was did. You, with ratings. Yeah, yeah, you made it, you made it work somehow. But anyway, that led to your syndicated show syndicated indirectly, show. which ultimately became the Geraldo Rivera show. Now, you say that people remember that show as sleazier uh, than it was. I agree. Yeah, uh, that's a, but, I, but, I reaffirm, I should say. But it was where you had your nose broken and the infamous skinhead brawl. And as you say in this the book, video brawl ever <laughs> and as you say, it was in that book that for the first time ever on TV, you did a DNA test to find out the paternity of a, a, of a child while the while the non father was on the set. Not too sleazy. Well, you know, I, when you look at the big picture, now that 
episode that you just described. It wasn't men in lace panties. It wasn't some of the other outrageous stories I did. The story that you know used DNA to reveal the true paternity and the guy, the non-dad there, punched the set as he leaves us. Thank you, Geraldo, his life destroyed. I just couldn't stay in it anymore. I had to get out. I had to, I had to leave. I, it, despite the fact that it was a money tree grown in my backyard yeah. and made me you know, fabulously wealthy, I just I, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to walk away from it. Even though, and I really do reaffirm what you said, uh, uh, it was a lot better show. It was a lot more... Uh, uh, it, it really did the, some gritty stuff. We were in the neighborhood. We yeah. had aftercare for people. Yeah, really. We did, uh, you know, uh, addiction... Uh, uh, alleviation and counseling and gang interventions. And we did a lot of good stuff, a lot of pioneering stuff. But people remember it for the burlesque. It's okay because I, I got out of the business, went right into NBC News, back to my roots as a newsman. I went to CNBC, Rivera Live, the highest rated show on uh, on that network. And then 9-11 happened. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. I mean, it was, it, it was the highest rated show on CNBC and it was one of the highest rated shows on cable at the time. Um, and and uh, in it, you were the biggest accuser of O.J. Oh, during the trial. And the, biggest, uh, and the biggest defender of uh, President Clinton during I, the Monica you know, Lewinsky. Everybody lies about Bush. No. <laughs> and, and we could talk about that show because there's some really interesting things that happen on that show. But it was, you know, you were making a lot of money at that show, uh, aside from it being so successful, but you decided to leave it, took a 60% pay cut to go to Fox. Why? You know, I was born on this island. I lost friends and neighbors on 9-11. It was such a stunning personal affront, aside from being a national tragedy and an outrage, that I, I, was, on, I was kind of chained to my desk at CNBC Rivera Live. They wouldn't let me go cover the war. Mm. So I said I quit, and I walked to Fox. My old friend Roger Ailes, who had been the president of CNBC, yeah. so he had hired me once there at CNBC, so he hired me again as the war correspondent, the senior war correspondent for Fox News. And, you know, I spent much of the next 12 yeah. years from 2001 and just until 2013, really, yeah. in Afghanistan or in yeah. Iraq or in Somalia. Or something. No, you took a big pay cut so you could go risk your life in war. Well, I wanted very much to get the guy yeah. who had done that to my friends. Yeah. And it and was the, very personal. And the guy was bin Laden. bin Laden. And in fact, in Afghanistan, you were the first and for a long time the only reporter in Tora Bora where bin Laden was hiding. And that was quite a coup. You were reporting from there where nobody else was. Nobody else was there. Um, nevertheless, that coup turned into one of the darkest moments of your career, oh. where you were accused of pretending to be in a, uh, where- Some place I wasn't. Yeah, 300 miles away from where three Americans were killed by friendly fire. What happened there? Well, I just, I, we had no feedback news. We heard that there had been this attack. I had just covered a friendly fire assault in which friendly troops had been killed by American bombs. Friendly fire is the dirty secret of Afghanistan. We never talk about it. Yeah. They, we've bombed the doctors without borders, hospitals. We've bombed schools. We've bombed weddings. We've made some terrible errors. I saw a friendly fire aftermath. I assumed, because I didn't have the facts, because they never released where the attack had happened, that what I saw was the friendly fire they were talking yeah. about, 300 miles away. Yeah. I mean, it's absurd to think I was lying. Everybody in the world knew I was in Tora Bora. The attack happened in yeah. uh, uh, what, the, uh, the city on the, uh, on the western side of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, I, I forget the name. I forget the name. It'll come to me. I mean, it was absurd to think that I was lying about it, but I couldn't fight back. And, you know, yeah. to fight back, I would have had to, first of all, reveal, uh, you know, more about friendly fire in the midst yeah. of the war. I was really kind of... Uh, and to the degree that you fought back, people ignored what you were they saying. They ignored it. By then, it had, it fit the stereotype. Yeah. Fox is, a, is BS. Yeah. Anything they say is not true. So I became a victim of a, of a bigger yeah. industry-wide kind of skepticism. And you took it so badly that I, you... I took it much worse than it was. And the book said that you... You, you say you contemplated suicide. I would have. I would have killed myself. I, you know, I almost tried to kill myself a, a million times, not by putting a gun to my head, but rather being as far out as I could in combat. Uh, you know, I never let anybody in front of me. I don't care mm. if my crew or, uh, uh, you know, or a rival journalist, nobody was going to beat me. I would outrisk mm. everybody. That's mm. how I would cleanse mm. my soul mm. of this uh, of this this tarnish more. Well, Geraldo, thank you so much again. The, the book is The Geraldo Show on Memoir. It's a great read. Thanks, Thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you.